just gave me permission to go ahead. She's on her way or won't, it won't be far away. So I'll give my opening statement and I think she'll be here before that's done. I'll look to staff for direction after that. Uh, it's been over two years since this caucus held its first hearing on synthetic drug abuse. At that hearing, we heard testimony from a constituent of mine named Michael Rosga. Mr. Rosga's son, David, committed suicide shortly after smoking K2. K2 is a synthetic marijuana that is very different from the naturally occurring product. David had legally purchased this synthetic drug at a local shopping mall. He then had a very rapid and negative reaction to it. I said then that David may have been the first person in the United States to die from using this kind of synthetic drug, but surely he wouldn't be the last. Sadly, my concerns were validated as the abuse of synthetic drugs continued to escalate. From 2010 to 2011, the number of calls received by poison control centers related to synthetic marijuana increased from 2,906 to 6,959. And similar calls about synthetic drugs known as bath salts increased from 304 to 6,138. Emergency room visits, uh, visits associated with synthetic drugs rose sharply as well. In 2012, Congress responded to this crisis. I worked uh, with the chairman, uh, Chairman Feinstein, as well as Senator Schumer, Klobuchar, and many others to pass the Synthetic Drug Abuse Prevention Act uh, 2012. That legislation placed many of these uh, synthetic drugs on Schedule I, making them illegal. That was an important step to protect, to help protect our young people from the effects of these drugs. There's some evidence that that legislation had a positive effect in, because in 2012, calls to poison control centers related to synthetic marijuana dropped from that 6,959 down to 5,200, still a very high figure. Similar calls related to bath salts dropped from 6,138 2,657, but new synthetic drugs have emerged since we passed that legislation. Traffickers need only to alter the chemical structure of their drugs to effectively circumvent the law, and these drugs continue to ruin lives in communities across the country. In the past, the, in just the past few weeks, news reports have linked a synthetic form of ecstasy called Molly to the deaths of at least four young people in Boston, New York, and here in Washington, D.C. What seems especially concerning is that authorities may not yet have a clear understanding of precisely what substances are contained in that drug referred to as Molly. Regardless of its precise chemical makeup, there appears little doubt that that drug is a clear and present threat to the health and safety of our young people. My home state of Iowa also continues to be affected by synthetic drugs. On a single weekend last May, three teenagers in Des Moines area were sent to the emergency rooms after smoking synthetic marijuana. One of them reported suffering cardiac arrest. There is some good news, however, because in communities across the country, citizens are helping to sound the alarm about the dangers of synthetic drugs. The Rosga family, the same Iowa family I referred to before, continues to share David's story. They have also started a website, k2drugfacts.com, which provides a forum for folks who survived encounters with synthetic drugs to share their stories. A community group called Iowans Against Synthetics has successfully pushed to have this week declared Synthetic Drug Awareness Week in Johnson County, Iowa. The Iowa Governor's Office of Drug Control Policy has also taken steps to raise awareness about uh, emerging drug trends such as synthetics. Beginning this month, the office is issuing a monthly newsletter called, quote, the title is The Connection. The newsletter will, pu will publish the latest news about new drugs in Iowa and trends among young people. But despite these positive actions, synthetic drug manufacturers still have the ability to circumvent the law 
by slightly altering their chemical compounds. A change of a molecule or two to a banned drug is sometimes enough to make a new and legal alternative. This is a difficult problem without an easy solution, but I look forward to hearing from the witnesses and working with our chairman, uh, Dianne Feinstein, to explore how we can continue to be effective in combating the abuses of these dangerous synthetic drugs, and at this point, I can thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you very much, um, Senator. Uh, I, I apologize for being late. The Judiciary Committee had a classified briefing on the NSA, and uh, so I was there, and I was the last one to have an opportunity to ask questions. So I thank you for going ahead with this. Um, I want to welcome our witnesses. And I just want to say that, in my view, synthetic drugs are diabolical. They're designed by scientists to mimic the effects of controlled substances. They're simi similar in chemical structure to Schedule I controlled substances. They're sold at gas stations, convenience stores, head shops, and on the Internet. The individuals who manufacture these products market them as harmless items, such as potpourri, bath salts, and believe it or not, plant food. The packages state that they're, quote, not intended for human consumption, end quote. And as you can see in the pictures to my left, they are packaged in a manner intended to appeal to our nation's youth. Scooby Snacks potpourri, Joker Herbal Sachet, for example, these package labels are intended to deceive users into thinking the products are harmless. As you can see in the pictures of a synthetic drug lab to my right, these products are not manufactured in clean and sterile facilities. Instead, they are clandestinely produced in storage facilities and warehouses using construction equipment like cement mixers and hand handheld pump-style pesticide sprayers. Make no mistake about it, these products are not safe, and the consequences of people using these drugs is sobering. In 2010, poison centers nationwide responded to approximately 3,200 calls related to synthetic marijuana and bath salts. In 2011, that number jumped to 12,000 834. That's a quadrupling in one year. And the majority, 65%, involve patients 25 years and younger. I don't think, in, and the vice chairman indicated this, that we have to look further than close by to see the ultimate consequence of synthetic drug abuse. Earlier this month, in a string of separate incidents, Four individuals attending concerts in New York, Boston, and Washington, D.C. died after taking a party drug referred to as Molly. This drug is generally recognized as the name given to party drugs containing ecstasy, a Schedule I controlled substance. However, some now believe that the synthetic drug mythalone and perhaps some other synthetic drugs may have been involved in these deaths. Other party drugs like 2CP and Crazy Clown are also bringing havoc on our communities. When Congress outlawed several of these synthetic drugs last year, traffickers didn't stop producing them. Instead, they slightly altered the chemical structure of illegal drugs to skirt the law. By making these alterations, the drug traffickers produced what we call controlled substance analogs, which mimic the effects of drugs like ecstasy, cocaine, PCP, and LSD. As I know we will hear today, determining whether a substance meets the vague legal criteria of a controlled substance analog really results in a battle of experts inside the courtroom and prosecutors putting up experts in the fields of chemistry and pharmacology to prove a substance meets the legal criteria, while the defense puts up experts 
to prove the exact opposite. The jury decides the issue, meaning that prosecutors and defense attorneys alike, dependent on whose experts were better at best expressing their opinion to the jury. Additionally, there is no precedent meaning that a decision in one case that a substance is an analog does not mean that it is automatically an analog in a second case. I introduce the Protecting Our Youth from Dangerous Synthetic Drug Act in July to give law enforcement the tools they need to prosecute individuals who produce and distribute controlled substance analogs. Specifically, this bill will establish an interagency committee of scientists which will be responsible for establishing and maintaining an administrative list of controlled substance analogs. The committee is structured so that it can respond quickly and robustly to the threat. Law enforcement officials have informed my staff that virtually all of these controlled substance analogs arrive in bulk from outside our borders. Therefore, this bill will also make it illegal to import a controlled substance analog on the list unless the importation is intended for non-human use. This bill sends a strong message to traffickers who try continually to circumvent our nation's laws. Congress recognizes that no matter how you alter the chemical structure of synthetic drugs to get around the law, they remain dangerous and should not be available for human consumption. So I look forward to our witnesses today. I'll introduce them in a moment, but I want to recognize the presence of the distinguished senator from Minnesota, who's had a great and compelling interest in this subject for many years now. And I hope that she will become a co-sponsor of my bill, and I look forward to her giving testimony here today. So if you would like to make a statement, Senator, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank you, Senator and Senator Grassley, for uh, conducting this important hearing. Uh, I want to thank you for being a partner on these issues. Senator Feinstein, uh, as chairman of the Drug Caucus, uh, you're a leader in the Senate on drug issues. You've been so for so many years. And I'm glad we were able to work together uh, this summer on this important new legislation. Uh, in July, I introduced a bill along with Senator Feinstein and Graham to help close the loophole in the analog drug law that allows synthetic drug makers to simply slap a label saying not intended for human consumption and then try to get away with it. I'm pleased to also co-sponsor your bill, oh, yes, you. uh, to create an analog committee uh, headed by the DEA. We were just so convincing at this moment. Uh, which would be able to establish and maintain a list of controlled substance analogs and quickly add to that list when new synthetics are developed. Uh, together, these bills are an important step in putting an end to the scourge of synthetic drugs. Until 2006, I was the county attorney in Hennepin County, Minnesota, with a population of over a million people. Uh, during my tenure, synthetic drugs was not something big that we saw. We were talking about meth, we were talking about coke, uh, we were talking about crack. Uh, we weren't talking about synthetic drugs, so it shows how quickly uh, this scourge has developed. In 2011, poison control centers across America received more than 13,000 calls about synthetic drug compared to about 3,200 in 2010. That is a one-year difference from 3,200 calls to 13,000 calls. In Minnesota, there was a total of 392 calls to poison control related to synthetic drugs in 2011 compared to 107 in 2010. According to a recent survey of youth drug use trends, one in nine U.S. high school uh, seniors surveyed admitted using synthetic marijuana during the year. According to a 2013 report in 2011, 28,000 emergency room visits involved some kind of a synthetic product, and 22,000 emergency department visits involved bath salts. The issue of synthetic drugs today cannot be more dire. This all hit home to me when a young man who was 19 years old, Trevor <coughs> Robinson of Blaine, Minnesota, died. He overdosed on a synthetic hallucinogen known as 2CE. And another young man is thought to have shot himself in Minnesota in the year uh, later while under the influence of synthetic drugs. This is a life and death issue. I've held hearings on this around my state. 
uh, and uh, with the North Dakota law enforcement contingent, and especially difficult in the rural parts of our state. There's been some good work done by the DAA, a major takedown of synthetic drug manufacturers in July 2012, Operation Log Jam. But I've heard time and time again uh, from prosecutors, especially in our more rural areas where they don't have as many resources, uh, that this is difficult. To skirt the law, uh, the drug manufacturers simply make a minor change. They change the molecular compound and slap this label that says not for human consumption on the drug. Then they flood the marketplace with dangerous and potent synthetic drugs that are very similar to the drugs that are marked illegal, uh, but they in fact advertise them to be legal. More and more new synthetics are hitting the streets. For example, synthetic drugs referred to as Molly have been in the news recently for causing illnesses and deaths at concerts up and down the East Coast. One of the saddest stories I remember is showing up at an event in um, Moorhead, Minnesota, and some people were sitting in the front row, and I'll be honest, I thought they were there to advocate against what we were doing. And I asked the sheriff if that's why they were there, and he said, I think so. Uh, they stood up and started to cry, this woman, and she said uh, that her brother had taken drugs before, uh, but he had never taken synthetic drugs before. And they, he thought they were the same thing as the regular drugs. And he got hooked on synthetics, and he got a really bad dose, and he got in his car, and he went over uh, and killed himself. Uh, those are the stories that we've heard from regular people, and it's our job as U.S. Senators to bring this problem uh, out in the light of day and fix it. And it may be complicated to fix it, uh, but we don't shirk from that duty. So I want to thank both of you for your good work and look forward to hearing the witnesses. Thanks very much, Senator Klobuchar. I think that was very helpful testimony. Um, I'd like to welcome our distinguished witnesses. I'd like to introduce all four of you at one time and then ask if you could confine your remarks uh, to five minutes. We have written copies of much of them, and then we can have an interesting uh, back and forth. Um, First, we have the Deputy Director of the Office of National Drug Control, Michael Botticelli. Uh, he has more than two decades of experience supporting Americans who have been affected by substance use disorders. Prior to joining ONDCP, he served as Director of the Bureau of Substance Abuse at Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Next, we have Nora Valkow. She is the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Volkow's work has been instrumental in demonstrating that drug addiction is a disease of the human brain. Among her many accomplishments, Dr. Volkow pioneered the use of brain imaging to investigate the toxic effects and addictive properties of abusable drugs. She was recently named one of Time Magazine's Top 100 People Who Shape Our World. Congratulations. Next, we are pleased to have Joseph Ranazzi, R R Ranazzi uh, return to the Drug Caucus. He is the Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Office of Diversion Control at the Drug Enforcement uh, Administration, known as the DEA. As Deputy Assistant Administrator, Mr. Ranazzi is responsible for overseeing and coordinating the investigation of major pharmaceuticals, forerunner chemicals, clandestine laboratories, and synthetic drugs. In addition, he is responsible for establishing drug production quotas. He was appointed as Deputy Assistant Administrator in January of 06 and has served with the DEA for over 25 years. And last but far from least, we are pleased to have Timothy Hefe, the United States Attorney for the Western Edition of Western Edition, the Western District of Virginia. Prior to taking office, Mr. Hefe served as Assistant U.S. Attorney in both the Western District of Virginia and the District of Columbia for 12 years. Throughout his career, he has prosecuted national security cases, narcotics, violent crime, and public corruption crimes. So, Mr. Botticelli, we will begin with you. Chairman Feinstein, Co-Chairman Grassley, Senator Klobuchar, thank you for the opportunity to address the caucus today on this most significant issue of synthetic drug use. 
as you uh, alluded to, Senator, I was the director for nine years of the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services in Massachusetts and saw on a state and local level the ravages that synthetic drug use had on the citizens of the Commonwealth. As you know, the Office of National Drug Control Policy was established in Congress in 1988 with the principal purpose of reducing illicit drug use, manufacturing and trafficking, drug-related crime and violence, and drug-related health consequences. We produced the National Drug Control Strategy, the administration's blueprint for drug policy. The strategy is a 21st century plan that treats our nation's drug problem as a public health issue, not just a criminal justice issue. During this time, we have seen some significant progress in reductions in the misuse of prescription drugs, cocaine, and methamphetamines. In 2013, however, also highlights the challenges that communities across the country are facing related to the use and threat of synthetic drugs. The contents and effects of synthetic drugs are unpredictable due to a constantly changing variety of chemicals used in manufacturing processes that are devoid of quality controls and government oversight. Use of these substances can cause a variety of significant health consequences, including death. I know that this caucus has long addressed emerging drug issues. Chairman Feinstein, you have addressed emerging drug issues throughout your career, both as mayor um, and in Congress addressing uh, the emergence of methamphetamine by championing the first major piece of legislation in 19. 19- well, thank you for knowing that. Thank, thank you. <laughs> I, I know. I'm, uh, I'm much older than my appearance. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my appearance. Oh, that was excellent. <laughs> what does that say about me? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm saying no more. Okay. Wait, no. <laughs> what you're so saying someone, is that Senator Feinstein is much younger. So, no, someone once said the know. best way to... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, to not dig a hole is to stop digging. Yeah, right. (laughs) Chairman Grassley, uh, I'll see if I can do better this time. Uh, (laughs) We know that in the last Congress, you introduced a bill to specifically address synthetic cannabinoids named in remembrance of your constituent, David Roska. And I know that uh, we have really appreciated the uh, Roska's uh, advocacy and leadership and have acknowledged them as advocates in our national drug control strategy. We also appreciate the caucus's support for ONDCP's prevention activities, since as we have seen time and time again, the best way to address drug use is to prevent it before it starts. Across the country, the use of synthetic cannabinoids is alarmingly high, especially among young people. There is an increasingly expanding array of synthetic drugs available. New synthetic drugs in the US market are the results of attempts to circumvent federal and state laws. As you know, President Obama signed into law the Synthetic Drug Abuse Prevention Act, which which placed five structural classes of synthetic cannabinoids and 26 specific compounds into Schedule I of the Controlled Substances Act. It also doubled the maximum period that the Drug Enforcement Administration can schedule these substances under its emergency authority from 18 to 36 months. States are also taking measures, both legislatively and otherwise, to address the expanding assortment of synthetic compounds. As these compounds are banned, suppliers make adjustments to their chemical compositions in an attempt to circumvent the law. The recent emergence of Mali is an example of the challenges that legislature, law enforcement, public health uh, are seeing due to the changing chemical composition of the product supply. Although federal law enforcement can potentially treat these new compounds as controlled substances under the Controlled Substance Analog Enforcement Act, Proving their similarity to an existing controlled substance is often a courtroom battle of scientists. Moreover, proving in one case that a particular substance is an analog does not carry over to subsequent cases. We look forward to working with Congress to help address the scientific and legal challenges posed by synthetic drugs. Synthetic compounds also create challenges with regard to drug testing. Synthetic drugs are not regular part of most drug tests. So some individuals may use them as a way to avoid workplace or law enforcement drug testing. Today, we released the results of an ONDCP-supported pilot study that suggests current drug testing screens can miss significant synthetic cannabinoid use. For example, 39% of men in a sample from the Washington, D.C. parole and probation system tested positive for synthetic cannabinoids but passed a traditional drug screen. In addition, state and local laboratories have been inundated with requests to identify new synthetic compounds. The availability of synthetic drugs over the internet is another challenge. ONDCP is working with the DEA and credit card companies to explore ways to halt the sales of these synthetics. 
ONDCP is taking steps to prevent the use of synthetic drugs by educating the public, particularly young people and parents. ONDCP manages the Drug-Free Community Support Program, which provides grants to nearly 700 community coalitions to prevent uh, and reduce substance use. Many of these coalitions have identified synthetic drugs as a growing problem in their community and have taken action. In addition, the Above the Influence campaign, part of the National Youth Anti-Drug Media campaign, has hosted discussions about synthetic drugs on its Facebook page, addressed emerging, synth uh, emerging synthetic drugs in radio and television outreach, and provided information on its website. The new home of the Above the Influence, the partnership at drugfree.org, has also addressed the issue of synthetic drugs, working with families to develop new ways to educate parents about their dangers. Synthetic drugs are not simply a domestic problem. They are major drugs of abuse in Europe and Asia and are emerging elsewhere. Many of the synthetic compounds found in the United States are made abroad, particularly in China and India. ONDCP Director Kurlikowski led a delegation to Beijing this past year where illicit movement of synthetic drugs from China was a top priority in discussions with Chinese officials. Director Kurlikowski also traveled to Vienna in June to mark the release of the 2013 World Drug Report from the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, which focused on the international prevalence of synthetic drugs. In conclusion, we continue to work with youth, parents, educators, our federal, state, local, tribal, and international partners to reduce synthetic drug use in America and welcome the opportunity to explore new approaches to address this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Volkow, please. Good afternoon. Um, Senator Chairwoman Feinstein, Feinstein, Senator Grassley, and Senator Klobuchar, thanks very much for inviting the National Institutes on Drug Abuse as part of the NIH to provide a perspective of the science on synthetic drugs. Synthetic drugs, substances with structures or effects similar to known abuse drugs, affect the central nervous system and can have stimulant, depressant, and or hallucinogenic effects. One such class of products, often referred to as K2 or spice, consists of plant material laced with synthetic cannabinoids that are similar to, but often more potent than THC, which is the main active ingredient in marijuana. Spice products have become increasingly popular, likely thanks to their easy access, non-detectability by standard drug tests, and the misperception that they are natural and therefore harmless. What makes these products particularly dangerous is their popularity among teens and young people whose brains are still developing. For example, 11.3% of high school seniors reported past year use of spice in 2012, a rate that is second only to marijuana itself among the illicit substances. Furthermore, over 60% of people admitted to an emergency department in 2011 for their reported spice use were between 20 and 20 years of age, between 12 and 20 years of age. Very little is known about the short and long-term health effects of spice, but we have reason to think that their potential health risks may be quite grave. These synthetic cannabinoids have not been tested in humans, so we don't know how long they stay in the body, how they are broken down, or at what doses they exert their effects. However, we do know that some of the cannabinoids found in these products bind much more strongly to cannabinoid receptors in the brain than THC itself, which could lead, of course, to more powerful and unpredictable effects. Indeed, some of the acute symptoms uh, seen in with spice as agitation, vomiting, seizures, and heart attacks are rarely seen in marijuana abusers, probably reflecting the greater potency of synthetic cannabinoid and the combination with other drugs. And just like marijuana, regular users of spice may experience addiction and withdrawal. Another class of synthetic substances on its own are the bad salts. The active ingredients most commonly found in these products are synthetic catenones, which can produce stimulants and other psychoactive effects, quite similar to amphetamines. <coughs> These compounds are considered alternatives to cocaine, methamphetamine, and ecstasy, and seem to be most popular for people in their 20s. Reported physical manifestations range, for, range from cardiovascular problems, elevated, bo elevated body temperature, hallucinations, paranoia, seizures, stroke, cerebral edema, heart attacks, 
sometimes resulting in death. Frequent users of bad salts can also experience addiction and withdrawal. These synthetic compounds are extremely powerful. For example, MDPV, one of the most common ingredient, is actually similar to cocaine and methamphetamine, but it's at least 10 times more powerful than cocaine, and its effects are lasting at least five times longer. Importantly, many synthetic stimulants can also not just affect dopamine, which is what makes them rewarding and makes them pleasurable, but also serotonin, which is a chemical in our brain that modulates our mood and perceptions. Therefore, bad souls have the potential to be highly addictive because of their dopamine effects, but also have effects on mood and perception, leading to hallucinatory behaviors similar to those seen with LSD or ecstasy, thus combining the effects of methamphetamine-like drugs and ecstasy-like into one single compound. So what is NIDA doing to address this problem? NIDA has a robust program to study the effects of synthetic drugs, including funding research on their mechanism of action and relative potencies, developing reliable tests for detecting them, exploring the many unknowns associated with the broad and easy access to this type of drugs, and developing strategies to help prevent abuse of these compounds. Through an interagency agreement, NIDA also evaluates the addictiveness of emerging drugs identified by the DEA to inform on their drug scheduling efforts. We're facing a new challenge. Technological advances, market globalization, and the internet have created a perfect public health storm as it relates to synthetic drugs that has hit us with an unprecedented speed and which is likely to spawn a continuing flow of diverse psychoactive synthetic drugs for years to come. Thus, it is critical to support more research designed to better understand not only the scope and consequences of synthetic drug use, but also the new cultural landscape driving it. Science remains the best approach to informing prevention policies and for developing therapeutic interventions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your timely remarks. Uh, Mr. Ranazizi, welcome. Chairman Feinstein, Co-Chairman Grassley, Senator Klobuchar. On behalf of Administrator Michelle Linhart and the men and women of the Drug Enforcement Administration, I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss the increasing synthetic drug threat across the United States. Could you speak directly into yes, the mic so that we don't miss it? You might. There you go. There's no doubt that designer drugs are becoming the go-to drugs for legal highs. The information coming from the poison control centers, scientific labs, emergency rooms, and medical examiners support this. We constantly hear the news reports just recently in Brunswick, Georgia, eight hospitalized related to the drug Crazy Clown. In New York City, two fatalities, four hospitalized related to Molly. In Denver, three overdose deaths, approximately 60 presenting to the emergency departments related to Black Mamba. With me today in the audience is Ms. Robin Smith. Ms. Smith can personally speak to the devastating consequences of these drugs. Her son has spent the last three years receiving treatment and rehab from the consequences of taking these substances because he made a poor decision. Thank you, Ms. Smith, for speaking to parents and communities. Could I interrupt you? Could you tell us what the consequences were from taking the drug in this one case? Uh, four attempted suicides, 18 visits in and out of the hospital, uh, he's been on medication for three years, all different medications, uh, antipsychotic and antidepressant medications. Um, it truly is a tragic case. Uh, and Ms. Smith is out there talking to community groups, talking to parents, uh, attempting to save lives, trying to stop kids from getting these drugs and ingesting them and trying to alert parents to the dangers of these drugs. And she's doing, she's a one man, a one woman show, and she's doing a phenomenal job. Well, we salute you, Ms. Smith. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for being here today as well. Thank you. In 2009, there were two different synthetic cannabinoids and four different synthetic cathinones on the retail market. By 2012, there were more than 56 different synthetic cannabinoids and more than 30 different cathinones. Today, we have identified approximately 200 different synthetic drugs that are taking their toll on America. 
They're known by trendy brand names like Eight Balls, Crazy Clown, and Black Mamba. They're labeled as household items like jewelry or glass cleaner, herbal incense, bath salts, and my favorite, badger repellent. Their packages have disclaimers like not for human consumption and for novelty use only, but they're really just drugs that have comp comp <laughs> comparable psychoactive effects on the brain and the body as LSD, methamphetamine, or marijuana. In this new era of drug trafficking, bath salts containing methylone or its analogs are not made for bathing, and herbal incense products containing cannabinoids do not have a pleasant odor when burned. Today's generation of designer drug packaging is designed to get non-controlled psychoactive substances into the retail outlets for sale. The packaging is a veil to hide the true identity and intended use of the product, a pretense for unlawful activity. After all, why would internet sellers need to discreetly package and ship legitimate products? And why would a half gram of bath salts cost $30? The pressing question is, why do our kids take these drugs when they're so dangerous? And the answer, these drugs are being touted as legal highs. Why? Because they are, unless and until DEA controls them or a prosecutor proves that the substance is an analog. Since 2008, 30 designer drugs have been controlled either through legislation or regulatory action. Yet since 2008, we have identified 250 designer drugs that are currently on the market domestically and abroad, and we anticipate seeing them in this marketplace. On, in, on May 16th of this year, DEA temporarily scheduled three synthetic cannabinoids. It was approximately 15 months from the time those drugs were encountered by law enforcement to the time there was enough data to control them. We cannot stand by and watch our communities suffer while we try to gather enough data to support administrative control of an endless variety of substances. The chilling reality is that these drugs are proliferating faster than DEA can administratively control them. DEA is cons constantly behind the clandestine chemists and traffickers who continue to quickly and easily replace new controlled substances with new non-controlled drugs. In fact, after DEA took action to temporarily schedule the five synthetic cannabinoids in March of 2011, Retailers almost immediately began selling new versions of the product that did not contain the controlled cannabinoids, but instead new versions of the compounds. Distributors and retailers openly admit that they will simply use a different drug when the drug is controlled. In addition to administratively controlling the designer drugs, DEA has led substantial enforcement operations to get these drugs off the street. Operation Logjam culminated in a nationwide takedown on July 25, 2012. This operation targeted manufacturers, wholesale distributors, and retail distributors of the designer drugs. During the operation, law enforcement seized $45 million in U.S. currency and bank accounts and additional assets valued at $5.7 million. But more importantly, more than 4.8 million packages of synthetic cannabinoids were seized. If those 4.8 million packets of synthetic cannabinoids made their way to the retail sale, that's potentially 4.8 million kids, teens, or young adults who could have been subjected to hospitalization, overdose, or even death from the psychoactive effects of those drugs. Project Synergy was completed in June of 2013 in 45 states. One distributor in one state showed the enormous financial incentive to be gained from selling designer drugs. During this operation, law enforcement seized enough synthetic cannabinoid products to gross approximately $21 million in revenue at the retail level, and that was from one single wholesale distributor. In sum, the wait to gather data sanctions the destruction and poisoning of our communities while profiteers make millions. Thank you for the opportunity to test before you, the caucus today. We look forward to working together with the caucus as well as our state, local, tribal, and federal counterparts to protect the public against the dangers of these ever-changing synthetic designer drugs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Heafy, perhaps you would tell us your experience uh, trying some of these cases. Yes, I, I will, Senator. Thank you very much for your invitation, Co-Chairman Grassley and Senator Klobuchar. On behalf of Attorney General Holder and my colleagues at the Department of Justice. We, we really appreciate the invitation to talk about this important issue. We also very much appreciate the historic work, Senator, that you and others on the Drug Caucus have done uh, on this issue. As prosecutors, we are only as effective as the statutory tools that we are given, uh, and we look forward to working with you to, to strengthen the tools that we have on this important issue. Uh, I became a United States Attorney in 2009. Uh, at the time, I didn't know anything about synthetic drugs, much like Senator Klobuchar. That was unknown to me. Uh, since then, I've become kind of a reluctant expert on this topic because we've seen an explosion, uh, a huge spike and increase in the use and abuse of these substances in my rural district in Virginia. I believe that that surge in popularity is because these drugs have a veneer of legitimacy. 
They are sold in slick packages, commercially manufactured. You can buy them at a convenience store. That creates the false impression among users that they're somehow safe, that they're somehow legal, in contrast to drugs that are sold in dark alleys in, in small plastic bags. In reality, these drugs, are, as you've heard, are extremely dangerous and potentially illegal. United States attorneys have responded to the increased use of synthetics by aggressively using the Analog Act to prosecute those who traffic in these dangerous substances. In order to prosecute a synthetic drug that is not specifically scheduled, we have to prove that it's chemically similar to a scheduled drug, has the same or intended pharmacological effect on a user, and is marketed for human consumption. Let me, in your experience, do you prosecute the sellers or the users? We prosecute the seller, Senator, but that can be very difficult. We have to establish first, through expert testimony, as you noted, that the substance is chemically similar to a scheduled drug. We have to prove that it had the same effect on a user, which is also often the subject of extensive expert testimony, experts called by the defense disagreeing with experts called by us. That's time intensive, that's resource intensive, and then lay jurors have to make a decision as to whether or not those elements have been satisfied. Even if we're successful in one case, that has no precedential effect on subsequent cases. We start over again in a, se a separate case. Uh, we also have to prove that it was marketed for human consumption. This has been the subject of Senator Klobuchar's bill, uh, and that can be difficult. Uh, the seller at the counter of the convenience store may have had a conversation with the user about how much to use or to be careful, but the upstream distributor, the wholesaler, the manufacturer, uh, we may not have such evidence that that person knew that the, dr the drug would be intended for human consumption, particularly when it is emblazoned with not for human consumption, which sets up a lack of knowledge defense. Those practical impediments are difficult for us, and we very much look forward to working with you to strengthen the Analog Act to make these cases uh, easier for us to bring. Now, in addition, there are timing issues. When a police officer finds uh, a stash of cocaine or heroin, he or she can immediately determine that it's an illegal drug and take action. With an analog substance that's not specifically scheduled, we don't have that probable cause to make an arrest, uh, to get a search warrant, to do those kinds of, of time-sensitive enforcement efforts that are so important. What happens is that they take the substance, then they go back and do some testing. During the intervening time, defendants flee, they change the chemical substance, evidence disappears, and again, that time lost handicaps our efforts. Now, in order for us to be successful, Senator, we need a strong analog act, but we need additional schedules, uh, these drugs going on the schedule, much like cocaine and heroin. And we also need to continue our prevention and education efforts. We have been very aggressive in many areas throughout the department at, at Attorney General Holder's direction to couple our enforcement efforts with vigorous support for prevention. And in the area of synthetic, the synthetic drugs, we have implemented that template aggressively. Not only have we brought these prosecutions under the Analog Act, but we have tried very hard to warn users of the dangers, to inform the sellers of these substances of the dangerous health effects and of the potential illegality. In Roanoke, Virginia, in my district, we delivered 40 letters to convenience stores that were selling the substance, informing them that this substance that is being sold at your store may be illegal under federal law under the analog statute. The vast majority of them immediately relinquished the substances. So at times, warnings matter and work, and we need to continue to get the word out about the dangerousness and illegality of these substances. We also need to partner with, uh, with healthcare professionals, with substance abuse providers, so that we are augmenting our enforcement with effective prevention. We have to get the word out to the young people like Ms. Smith's son who potentially fall victim to this. It's imperative that we continue our efforts on uh, prevention uh, and education. Uh, we very much look forward at the department, Senator, to working with you on the synthetic drug substance uh, and appreciate your leadership on this important issue. Well, thank you very much. Thank all of you very much. The three of us are also on the Judiciary Committee, and that would be the committee that would hear any such bill. Uh, this is a caucus rather than a full-fledged uh, Senate committee. It seems to me that in terms of drafting legislation, which is going to be effective, it's very difficult. And uh, I think we have to describe analog drug. I think we have to say intended for human consumption, 
and I think we have to say, cannot be falsely labeled and packaged in some way. Uh, what else would the law enforcement people here recommend? How do we approach this? The simplest way uh, to make something illegal is to put it on the schedule. Uh, when we have a heroin... But what would we put on the schedule? I believe we have a long, long list and... General but then DC. they just change one chemical and it's no longer on the schedule. Exactly, Senator. We'll have to continually look at the emerging trends and aggressively schedule these drugs going forward. But immediately now, there are 30, 40, 50 chemicals that we've already identified and proven in trials as analogs, despite the fact that it doesn't have precedential. But value. you're saying take those chemicals and put those chemicals on the schedule. Yes. And, and well, supposing something legitimate is made from the chemicals. Uh, the chemicals that we're, look, we're looking at now have no legitimate use. They're, 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 they're not even considered, re they're sold as research chemicals, but they don't have any legitimate use. Can you give us a list of those chemicals? Absolutely. In fact, some of those chemicals have, uh, we have not analogued, so we would need to make them controlled in order to analog them. They do have pharmacologic and, chemi and, and, and some structural similarity, yet not enough to move them over into an analog. If we move them to an analog, then we could prosecute the other drugs that are structurally similar to them. There's, there's such a wide range of drugs out there right now in different classes, some that we haven't seen in this market yet, that are destined for this market. See, I, uh, th this is the problem because let's say there are three chemicals used in a given drug. Let's say it's a bath spice. And the kids know that they can use this and get a high. So you, 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 you put the three chemicals on the schedule. Now they see this, they change one of the chemicals, that's all they have to do to avoid it. You, you're absolutely right, uh, So, Chairman. And it seems to me that that's an unrelenting number. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, and then you don't know what is the really deadly part of that combination of chemicals. And, and that's the point. We have no idea which one of these are going to be the next drug to put hundreds in the hospital and kill many. Uh, we just need to catch up. We're so far behind. We, we could be close to, uh, at the end of this hearing, we could be close to 200 compounds behind, and we just don't have... Uh, but the ability to keep administratively scheduling these drugs. There's a falsity here. The falsity is in the packaging. Absolutely. And the selling uh, in, a, in a drug store as a bath spice or some other innocent thing. And the so-called cognoscenti learn quickly that, oh, you can buy this bath spice and we'll go to a party and we'll use it. Um, so I think... The intention is not that it be used as a bath spice. The intention is that it be used internally as a drug. So it seems to me if something is packaged like that to be used internally as a drug, you want to prohibit that. You cannot make something for a purpose like that, that it's not intended. You're absolutely correct. And then. The same thing is false labeling on the package, the, the second thing. And if we could tackle that, uh, in other words, it's illegal to sell something which is really intended for human consumption as a commodity for another purpose. Now, maybe I'm whistling Dixie. Mr. Heafy, what no, do you think? I don't think, I don't think you're whistling Dixie Senator at all. There will always be, uh, because of the profit motive here, continuing, uh, continuing evolution of the substance. We can right. schedule every six months, and the, the folks making this will always stay a step ahead. So there will always be a need for an analog type statute. We can, however, further modify the statute to define more specifically how to prove not for human consumption. We could put on the face of the statute, for example, that if the labeled product is, is ineffective, if, if it is not something that actually creates a, an odor when yeah, soaked in water, spice. bath it spice, smells exactly. horrible. that would be per se evidence that it is not. 
that it is, in fact, intended for human consumption if it's not, if it does not have efficacy for the purpose as labeled. There are ways in the statute, and I believe Senator Klobuchar's bill does exactly this, to define more specifically how we can make a showing that this is intended for no legitimate use, but rather as a drug to get people high. That would provide right. us as prosecutors in the courtroom with more of that ammunition right. that we need to prove. So you think we have it in that bill? I think the bill is an important step forward that helps us prove that important element of the statute. Good. Uh, Senator Grassley? I'm going to start out with a couple questions related to drugs, but not uh, the synthetic drugs. Uh, I want to start for the three of you on the left here, a question about Colorado, Washington, and uh, recreational marijuana, and the Cole Memorandum suggested that uh, DOJ won't uh, seek to enforce federal laws banning marijuana in those states except in certain priority areas so long as they implement effective regulatory regimes. So my question to each one of you is, were each of your organizations adequately consulted by the Deputy Attorney General's office as they developed this new policy on uh, marijuana enforcement? You ought to be able to answer whether or not you were contacted. Maybe it would be a little more difficult for you to say what your advice to them was, but I do ask you, did you were you in favor or against the new marijuana policy that was adopted? Start with you. Um, our office was consulted during that process in terms of what uh, the Attorney General's decision was going to make. And um, I think that they have clearly articulated uh, federal priorities as it relates to the eight criteria that they released in terms of looking at the, the ramifications of the legalization of marijuana in both Colorado and Washington and have laid out uh, um, and have reserved the right uh, to preempt the laws uh, given uh, what they anticipate or they expect as uh, state regulatory frameworks to make sure that, for instance, they're not diverting uh, marijuana to youth, that they're not seeing criminal activity attached to those uh, activities. And you gave them advice according to how you described their policy, is that uh, right? Uh, our focus clearly uh, is uh, uh, understanding um, and articulating the what we are uh, concerned in terms of the public health implications. And I think that is reflected in the Department of Justice criteria as it relates to particularly diversion uh, of, of, of marijuana in both Colorado and Washington to youth. Dr. Balcal. We, we were um, consulted as part of ONDCP since we provide a scientific uh, assessment. And and our, our mission is science, so we are not per se on policy. Our concern has to do with, uh, first of all, we're speaking about synthetic drugs, and I was listening with intent about how do you try to regulate access to these synthetic drugs on the one side of our country, and on the other one, we're basically getting a drug that we know it's addictive. And so, so what our concern is, is that when you're speaking about marijuana, whether it is for medical or recreational purposes, you're speaking of a very different class of drugs. There's not one marijuana. For example, the content of 9-THC, which is the active ingredient, can vary enormously from one cigarette to the other. When someone smokes marijuana, there's a multiplicity of cannabinoids that they are actually ingesting. There's one of them, for example, cannabidiol, that antagonizes THC. So the effects are likely to be very, very different depending on the type of marijuana that you're getting. So when one speaks about this notion of legalization of a substance where we actually don't even know exactly ingredients or medical properties, to me is basically going backwards on the way that we've tried to regulate substances that are going to be for human consumption. Our main concern amidst all of these issues is so young people because it is the young people. You're telling me your advice to the Department of Justice, is that right? I'm telling you our concerns. I do not, oh. we do not advise on policy. We basically provide evidence. Well, uh, did they, uh, they did consult you though, you said? We, we provided information with, with respect to the, the dangerous. How about oh. you, Mr. Rannis? Well, sir, uh, I wasn't personally consulted. However, uh, I believe that the department did consult uh, okay. The administrator's office. If you're asking me, my views, and I think that's no, I don't. Well, I okay. don't need your views. Okay, um, Mr. Ranazzi, there's something that you're involved in that I'm concerned me very much. Uh, 
As you know, according to the Government Accountability Office, the DEA is refusing to comply with the legal obligations to provide GAO access to DEA records. Senator Whitehouse, who you know is a Democrat, and I, who you know is a Republican, have a GAO request for a report on drug shortages that is being held up because of DEA's refusal. I tried to help resolve that dispute, but the Justice Department told DEA not to even meet with me and GAO to discuss it. Of course, that's unacceptable. I've raised the issue personally with uh, a Deputy Attorney General Cole. I understand the uh, Department Attorney General conceded that DEA has a legal obligation to comply. However, the Justice Department and DEA are still withholding records from uh, GAO. This standoff risks wasting time, taxpayers' money on litigation with GAO that the DEA will eventually lose. So I'm asking you, uh, we need you to work with Congress to resolve this dispute and get GAO the information it needs to do the work. GAO first made the request uh, from DEA on October 2012. A year has come and gone with no resolution, and that's far too long for this to go unresolved. What do you think is a reasonable amount of time to get back to GAO and resolve these issues? Well, in fairness to you, uh, Senator, I uh, wasn't prepared to talk to you about GAO today. However, we've been in discussions with GAO. In fact, we uh, believe two days ago had a discussion with GAO over different uh, requests. And I believe that was one of the requests we brought up. Uh, we're attempting to reach a mutually agreeable position where we could uh, provide information. They're requesting proprietary data that's related to the drug industry. Uh, and we don't want a wholesale release of that data without, uh, and that's what we're dis discussing right now, what they need and how we can give it to them in the best possible mm -hmm. format. And uh, I believe we're close. Uh, the last negotiations between our agencies went very well, and I, I believe we're close. Okay. I have an email that says that you're the main impediment to getting that resolved, so I hope you'll get it resolved. Uh, I'm, I've abused my time. I'll go to her, and then I'll ask questions on a second round. Right. Uh, Senator Klobuchar, you would like to? Thank you very much. Thank you to both of you. Uh, I want to start, Mr. Heafy, with talking about uh, the legislation. And uh, I really did, sometimes we can get up solutions that make a huge difference. I was thinking back as I was sitting here to meth labs and how uh, getting some of the ingredients behind the counter at drugstores seemed so small, but certainly made a difference in our state. We literally had kids coming up from Iowa that we got on a complaint. They said to the cops that they came to Minnesota because we didn't have it behind the counter. Um, and we were able to pass it in our legislature and it made a huge difference in the reduction in the meth labs blowing up and other things. This thing, um, I think that this is a good idea, what we're trying to do here, uh, Senator Feinstein's bill and the bill I have for the intended for human consumption, this idea of specifying the factors that a judge would consider whether in determining whether it was in fact this product that whatever it is before them was intended for human consumption and also saying that a defendant could not use this label and say well that means it's okay um, i think that's very important and it came out of hearing from you guys about what you needed um, and so i'm not going to ask a lot of questions on that as much as is there other things that we should be doing um, i know we grappled with what we could do to make it easier to prove up an analog um, I know that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Renazizi talked about making it easier to um, get these substances scheduled. Uh, the three of us already worked on bills with um, s uh, some of the other drugs, spice and other things, got them scheduled, but you know we were blocked by a uh, senator and it took us uh, about a year to do it. And we can't have that happen again. So I just wanted to see some other ideas in addition to my bill, Senator Feinstein's bill. Is there anything that we're missing here about how we can make it easier to prove up an analog? Uh, it's a good question and one we we'll, we'll, should continue to talk about. As you said, Senator, when we see things in the field, uh, because of our prosecutorial work, they sometimes lead to suggested changes. We had an issue in one of our bath salts trials where the defense lawyer made the argument that the same chemical substance needed to be the one to which the analog was chemically similar, pharmacologically impact. Um, and we argued that it didn't have to be the same substance, it could be any substance. So a slight tweak in the statutory language to change 
uh, to any controlled substance from A would make that absolutely clear. So there are technical changes to the analog statute that I believe our, our folks would like to talk more about. Yeah, I just want to make sure that um, if we are moving some things to the Judiciary Committee that we include some of these other things. I remember looking at it and it was, there were constitutional issues with some things and other things, but I, my guess is there's some other things we could do. I don't know if others want to answer. No? Okay. Um, one question I had again is the link uh, to terrorist organizations. A lot of these uh, drugs are sold internationally, uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Renazizi, in your um, June takedown operation synergy, uh, did any of the enforcement actions involve terrorist organizations or dealers connected to terrorist organizations? I don't believe that there were direct connections to any terrorist organization. However, I will go back and review the cases. And have you seen any of these links? Not specifically, but the fact that so much of these substances are manufactured overseas without a lot of clarity or ability for us to determine where the money goes, there, there's a substantial risk, uh, Senator, that they could be funding all kinds of nefarious activity. And uh, Mr. Botticelli, a lot of these um, are made internationally, particularly in China, is that correct? Correct. And so um, I would figure that makes it even harder to go after them and more important that we at least are able to prove up the local cases. This has been a significant uh, focus for both us at ONDCP and quite honestly the State Department in working with um, both the Chinese delegation uh, directly uh, as well as through the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Uh, I think at least the components that we've been dealing with in China have been uh, responsive to our issues and concerns and we're uh, cautiously optimistic in terms in terms of the uh, uh, response of the Chinese government. We have been working closely with the DEA uh, and obviously the State Department to make sure uh, that we do get better cooperation from the Chinese government. Okay, uh, one last question, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ranazizi. I keep saying your name wrong. How do you say it? Ranazizi. Ranazizi. Um, uh, that is on a different topic and that involves the DEA and prescription drug disposal. As you know, nearly two years ago, this president sent into law the prescription drug bill that I passed with uh, Senator Cornyn. It directed the DEA to write rules to facilitate easier and legal disposal of prescription drugs. I think just that chart up there, there shows you why a number of the things that kids get hooked on, number two, uh, after marijuana, uh, are prescription drugs. And um, what we're simply trying to do is find a way for people uh, who are uh, at home, uh, rather than telling them, oh, grind up your leftover drugs with uh, coffee grinds, uh, which isn't very practical in today's world, uh, or flush them down the toilet, which doesn't seem like a very good idea for our water supply. We're trying to make things easier than just simply having to find the once a month sheriff's drop off. Some places have better uh, drop offs, but it's very difficult for people to get those addictive drugs off their shelves. They literally don't know what to do and they're just keeping them in their shelves where teenagers can find them. Um, so that's why we are so intense about trying to get these regulations done. We think two years has been too long. Um, when do you think we're going to be able to get the regulations done? Senator, I, I share your concerns. Uh, we are working diligently to get them done. We had over 200 comments, or approximately 200 comments from the notice of proposed rule. We're in the final stages of drafting the final rule. Actually, the final rule has been drafted. It's going through the last bit of in interagency, in internal agency vetting before it goes out into the government other government agencies for vetting and review. We're hoping that by the end of the year we have a rule. In the meantime, we have a national take back day on October 26th, working with our federal, state, and local. Well, uh, like what if you are, you know, have a kid's soccer game that day? I mean, I, I, I love these take back days, but I just think there should be a more routine way to get rid of the old drugs. And, and there will be. Yeah. And there will be, and it'll be safe and efficient and uh, just bear with us a little longer. There was a lot of competing interests here and there was a lot of things that we needed to get done uh, to help the other agencies mm -hmm. uh, comply with this new I rule. I just think we all know how many leftover drugs people have. They go and have a dental surgery, they use mm -hmm. only one because they're okay and then they've got 10 things left and they're sitting in their cabinet and they're, don't mark, when's the next take back day in four months on the calendar and circle it with a red star? I, I just don't think it happened. So that's why I, that. I think if we had a routine thing, if we get, get some of our drug stores to start taking them and felt comfortable under the rules, uh, we would be in such better shape. So I'm just gonna urge you to 
keep going and I'll go after all the interagencies that are working on the interagency review. So thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to, uh, Mr. Botticelli, take advantage of your presence to ask you about an issue that's particularly important to the Central Valley of California. As you know, California is the largest domestic producer of marijuana in America, with over 1,800 marijuana farms, grow sites, in the Central Valley so far this year. It is, is of serious concern to the 81,000 farms in the area. Um, I wrote a letter to Director Kierlikowski asking him to provide 750,000 in uh, 2013 discretionary funding to the Central Valley HIDA, which could support uh, marijuana investigative teams in Fresno, Redding, and Sacramento. Um, this is a real problem. Uh, they're guarded by armed men. Uh, there are going to be real problems coming, and there's so much of it. It can't possibly be used for medical marijuana. It has to be used. And um, th there is huge dismay about it within the Central Valley. Um, I'd like to ask that you bring this request to the director's um, attention and hopefully we can get some help. Uh, the sheriff of Fresno, her name is Margaret Mims, and she's terrific. Uh, she's appeared before, this, before the Judiciary Committee. Um, and so people just can't meet the problem in any way. Chairman Feinstein, um, uh, we are tremendously supportive of the work in Central Valley, and I actually had the opportunity to travel there last month okay. and talk with our HIDA directors, uh, as well as our federal, state, and local colleagues, and saw firsthand and did flyovers of many of the counties that you mentioned in looking at uh, not only the proliferation of marijuana grows on public lands, but increasingly, as you uh, so well articulated, on increasingly on private lands, and heard from many county administrators, local sheriffs, in terms of the issues issues uh, that they are running into. Um, so we are committed to supporting that. Um, uh, we are um, uh, going to be announcing discretionary grants uh, to our HIDAs in the next couple of weeks. Um, unfortunately, due to sequestration, our dollar amount that we had available for discretionary funding uh, was cut uh, in half. Uh, so we only have three million, uh, but we clearly understand the pressures that are under, and I've uh, heard directly from uh, both local law enforcement uh, and property owners in terms of the magnitude of the issue. As you articulated, it's pretty astounding. Um, we're also, we also chair the public lands uh, group, so we will be working with our colleagues in the USDA and the Forest Service in terms of providing information, particularly to local farmers who are often renting uh, their farm and, to, yeah. uh, and very unsuspecting in terms of what's happening on their public lands and find out once they know that grows are happening are left little legal, legal recourse because of the way their lease is structured. So we'll be working with them in terms of trying to help develop guidance for local farmers so to make sure that lease agreements are, are airtight and they have the ability to evict Good. people. Good. Do you have a mechanism for doing this? So, as I indicated, we chair the Public Lands Committee and are working closely with the USDA and Forest Service to get could, their input Could I make a suggestion? Please do. Um, Friant has 15,000 farmers. To work through the Friant Water District would be one way. The California Farm Bureau would be another way. Um, the big farm organizations uh, I can give you, uh, and I think that would, with respect to the contract in particular, um, it's a growing problem. Mm -hmm. And what bothers me is the, grows, the growers are armed, and there's going to be an incident, uh, I'm sure of that, one day. I clearly heard that from uh, both local farmers and actually people on public lands too, in terms of right. the hiking. So yeah, we'd in be happy national parks. on national parks. Yes. So we'd be happy to work with you and your staff on okay. how we can uh, assist that very in those much. efforts. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Senator. I wasn't going to talk about what you just talked about, but it, and I don't know anything about agriculture in California, but in Iowa, you know, you got these maps, uh, satellite maps and everything that can tell you just exactly how many acres of corn and how many acres of, of soybeans there are and what the crops are here and there. 
Aren't those maps available for California so you can find out where they're growing marijuana? I, I believe they do have access to some resources in terms of looking at, um, uh, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I believe that some of the local folks do have access to some um, uh, uh, kind of aerial photographs uh, around kind of where they're seeing grows. Um, I think that um, their, their uh, resources and abilities uh, have been uh, growing in terms of really honing uh, satellite imagery um, as well as aerial imagery in terms of looking at where they have particular hotspots. I don't want that to take away from my time because I want to ask some questions about Molly of the Santa two people. But before I do that, one follow up to you, Mr. Anazizi. Uh, when I ask you about the coal amendment, uh, I, ne I didn't get an answer of whether or not uh, DEA agreed or disagreed with the new marijuana policy on uh, to forego federal, federal preemption and the and the local and the prosecution in those two states. I, I don't believe that uh, we agreed to forego prosecution. I, first of all, uh, when we're talking about marijuana, it's still a Schedule One controlled substance. It's still illegal under federal law. We don't generally, we don't go after users of marijuana, and we never have. Uh, so all of these alleged prosecutions of users just don't exist. That's not what we do. Okay. So. Uh, and a follow up on where you left off with the previous thing I discussed with you. I think you said something about you're getting very close. Uh, just so you know, I, I want you to know I was born at night, but not last night. And DEA has, uh, uh, DEA has told us for a long period of time uh, that uh, both uh, GAO and my office, that they were close to reaching an agreement. Now that was uh, over the whole as long as one year ago. You, and then additionally, you say that DEA is concerned GAO will release uh, confidential information to the public. Yet when asked by my staff if GAO has ever violated confidential information, your answer has always been no. So again, I have to ask why the delay, but I don't want you to answer it because I got your answer, but I want you to know we're going to get to the bottom of this. And uh, if you, there'll be other ways we can do it if we can't get your commitment here. In regard to Molly, in recent weeks, uh, news reports have linked a drug with a street name Molly to the deaths of at least four young people attending concerts and nightclubs, Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C. The suddenness and le lethality of these substances appear to be truly alarming. So to you folks, you two folks, um, what do we know about Molly at this point? Is it simply ecstasy or an analog of ecstasy, or is it a recreational drug that has been contaminated? Um, and that would be to both of you. And then I have some other questions on the subject. Ecstasy, ex uh, Molly is supposed to be 100% pure ecstasy, and what has happened is the purity of ecstasy has been going down. And uh, when Molly came around, you can buy a drug that in principle should be pure ecstasy. And hence, the consequences are likely to be much more adverse. Uh, one of the problems why people die with ecstasy is that it has, it increases serotonin, which regulates temperature in your brain. And when they are in a party and exercise, um, dancing, temperature can go, that, go up and they lead to an hyperthermia that is very, very difficult to control, causing death. Now, what has also been reported is when you buy Molly, like when you buy any of these drugs, you cannot guarantee that you're getting what you're supposed to get. So, so they're some, contaminated. Yeah, exactly, absolutely. They are going to contaminate the things that are less expensive. So you don't, you are again faced with a situation with that depending on the randomness of combinations, you may end up with something that is particularly toxic. Then this is made even uh, harder because the patient the individual gets very agitated, takes to the emergency room at uh, hospital, and the doctors don't know what to treat because they don't know what that particular person has on board, which makes it much more difficult than to address as an emergency. So Molly is ecstasy in principle, but it is in some instances clearly contaminated, though ecstasy by itself in its purity can be very, very, very dangerous drug too. And it's another synthetic compound. 
and you might have something to add or you might just agree with her. I, I agree with her. I just want to add that uh, what we've seen over and over again is you have a new substance and you know that the term Molly is accepted. Kids will buy it because it's supposedly Molly, so they'll just purchase believing that it's indeed MDMA, which traditionally is Molly, and it could be a totally different substance. It's just another marketing tool that they're using to get these drugs to our kids. And then specifically to you and your agency, what specifically is DA doing to protect the public from Molly? We're uh, doing invest we're conducting investigations in cooperation with the different state and local agencies that are working these particular cases uh, to find out where the drug's coming from. Once we find out where the drug's coming from, once we find out what the drug is, we'll be able to better, better handle the situation. But we are conducting state and local federal cooperative investigations to determine where that drug is coming from, what the source of that drug is. Okay, now to our Virginia prosecutor, I understand from your testimony that prosecutions under the Controlled Substance Analog Enforcement Act are difficult, and your written testimony informs us that from 86 to 2011, there were approximately 62 individuals prosecuted for distributing analogs under the Act, and from 2011 to the present, 280 individuals have been similarly charged. Do you know how many of those prosecutions resulted in plea bargains or convictions as opposed to acquittals? And even if you don't know the specific numbers, is it fair to say that you would expect that the overwhelming majority of those charged pled guilty or were convicted? Senator, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm quite certain that the percentage <clears throat> of analog cases, which must be resolved through trial and do result in an acquittal is much higher than in really every other category of our drug prosecutions. Uh, that's because of these, these difficulties that we have in establishing the elements. A, a good defense lawyer knows that he or she has a fighting chance to demonstrate some, to one juror at least, that there isn't sufficient similarity or that his client did not know that this was going to be marketed for human consumption. And that leads to more trials and fewer plea bargains. Can I just say one yes, thing? Yes, sure, go ahead. Let's just have, as I understand this, everything is contested in a court. So every time you go in, you have to prove that the individual drugs used contributed to the death. Is that right? There is no set uh, rule. Senator, everything within the analog statute, each separate element must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury. And that is why we have a defense expert who will say it's not chemically similar to uh, MDMA or a scheduled substance, and a government expert will say it is. Well, doesn't that mean there's something wrong with the analog statute? Uh, again, I think unless we schedule that substance and make that substance per se illegal, we have no choice but to go through but the then they analog. change one of the chemicals. Exactly. So you have to keep, I mean... Uh, I would envision a process by which we continually add to the schedule over time, but you're right, Senator, there will always be tweaks in the formula that require the use of some kind of analog statute. We can strengthen the analog statute, as we discussed, with respect to marketing for human consumption, but we'll always have a need for it. Uh, we'll never be able to get ahead of the considerable talent uh, and entrepreneurship that's on the other side. I mean, supposing you, you combine three drugs or three chemicals and one is harmless, mm -hmm. but it's, let's say it's put in there for some reason to hold the stuff together or whatever it is. It just doesn't seem to me to be a good way to go about it. It, it, is, it is always going to be difficult. Your earlier question suggested that we have to prove that there's been some negative consequence. We don't need necessarily to show that the drug was harmful. We've had cases in which the drug, the synthetic drug was sold and there isn't any evidence that uh, one of these terrible outcomes that we've heard about occurred, but nonetheless, it's still illegal under the analog statute. Well, uh, it's your, you, you oh, go yeah. on. I, oh. Want me to go ahead? Oh, no, I no, don't. If you I go could ahead. Finish, Absolutely. I have a four o'clock up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, my next question is for the two people there in the middle. Uh, we know that synthetic drug manufacturers are able to slightly modify their chemical formulas to make new synthetic drugs. How many different types or classes of synthetic drugs do we, do we uh, know are in existence? What percentage of these are analogs of currently 
scheduled drugs. In other words, to what extent is a synthetic drug problem an analog drug problem? Let's, let me start with you, Mr. Renesisi. The synthetic uh, drug classes pretty much right now are endless. Uh, I'm just looking at a, a designer drug chart right now with over 20 different classes and subclasses of drugs. I, I, I couldn't even give you a, a number of classes because the classes change pretty much on a weekly basis of what we're seeing both in the literature, on the internet, and actually in our labs. Uh, I can just tell you there's a lot of them. And over 200 thus far that we've identified 200 sub individual substances that are both potentially analogs or standalone non-analog, non-controlled drugs from the wide spectrum of classes. There, I, I, to get a number, I would go back and I'd tell, I could give you a number that we have now, but that's going to change. It's impossible to state it because it's changing so fast. Is that? Absolutely. That's probably the. That's right. Okay. And I, I think we'll have to be satisfied with that answer. Uh, and I suppose you agree with that, or do you have another point of view, Dr. Bob? No, I, I agree completely. And the only thing that I would say is I would divide them among the classes. Synthetic drugs will emulate the different classes of drugs of illicit drugs of abuse. So you have cannabinoids, and you have spice and K. You have stimulants, and you have bad salts. You have uh, now also opiates. So you will start to generate an analogs of these compounds that are out there for purposes of diversion. And you can go with chemistry in a multiplicity of directions, which is why it's so extraordinarily difficult. But that said, Senator, I don't think that means we should throw up our hands and say we can never get ahead of it. There, these 50 compounds have already been seized, are already identified as no legitimate use, extremely volatile and harmful. And while we may not get ahead of the manufacturer, we can at least do our best to stay as, as close to current as well, possible by scheduling well, these drugs. Well, drug. Senator Grassley, is he, let, let me give you something. Just I just wrote it down. I don't know whether it makes any. Chemicals that are spac packaged and labeled as not intended for human consumption, but the intent is that the product be used for human consumption should be illegal if it contains chemicals that either alone or combined can be injurious to human health. Now, something like that, this is very, because you can list chemicals that you know, but then there are going to be all this stuff that you don't know. But the point that's diabolical to me is how these things are packaged. I hope I didn't run you out. Okay, thank you. one question. Okay. Um, and I, th I really think we need to grapple with this. And it's very hard because it's not at all clear cut. And I don't know how you keep making, can make cases if the chemicals keep changing, but the intent of the cell, of the producer is what I would go for because clearly the intent of the producer is for human consumption and they guise it this way and with not intended for human consumption and by name you know, bath spices or candy or whatever it might be. Right. And I think this is what makes it so diabolical. I agree 100 percent, Senator. We tried a case in Charlottesville, Virginia, where we were fortunate that we had a cooperating witness who was making recorded telephone calls to her out-of-town supplier in which there was a discussion of how users were reacting. We had actual evidence of the defendant's knowledge of human consumption. We don't always have that particularly as you move up the chain of distribution. Just like any business, the, the distribution, the manufacturing distribution has a hierarchy. And the higher you go and the distance from the point of sale, the more difficult it is. So what happened in the case? It was a conviction because, yeah. again, we, we had the, the expert showing of chemical And this familiarity. was the producer? This was against, a, not, a, not a manufacturer, but someone who was a wholesaler who was shipping okay. through the mails the substance so, into our community. So what law was he convicted of violating? It was an analog act conviction. We, we had to go through the, the difficult showings that we talked about earlier. We had evidence of his statements evidencing knowledge of human consumption. That's not always available. We were fortunate in our case that we had that direct evidence. If we could add elements to the statute, which would provide a list of factors to be considered like the product itself does not work for the purpose on the label, 
that could be a, 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 a circumstantial factor considered by a judge or jury, that would help us, in the absence of statements, establish that a defendant intended it for human consumption. Right. Well, let me ask you this. W would you all be willing to take a look at Senator Klobuchar's bill, at my bill? Um, I mean, we could easily put them together, uh, but there's something more here that we have to get at. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we have to provide a methodology for the future mm -hmm. in a kind of arena that's going to be constantly changing, where what is really harmful is illegal, and how we can do that. And could each of you do that? And, and look, would you be willing to and let us know what you think and what your recommendations would be? On behalf of the Department of Justice, absolutely. We'd be glad to work with okay. you and, and your staff, Senator. All right. But can you get back to us then after you do that? And my staff will get you, each one of you, copies of both bills. Mm -hmm. And um, we would like to produce something that could go before our full, well, before the Judiciary Committee and have a chance of making a difference here. I was asking about Molly. I, I don't know. I gather Molly is a pill, and it is sold at big rock festivals and that kind of thing. Um, does anybody warn people not to purchase this or tell people what it does to the individual? I think there's significant opportunity to, to um, uh, ramp up efforts to make sure that people understand kind of what they're taking. And as Dr. Volkow said, to make sure that they understand that they're not taking pure ecstasy. I, I heard an interesting NPR story from one gentleman who watched his friends overdose. And he said, well, it's my friends. They don't know how to take it when he himself had no idea what's in store. I think the other opportunity is how do we work with concert promoters, that they have some culpability yes. here in terms of, 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 of making sure that they're providing education, since we know that that's happening, and make sure that they're policing events and providing opportunity. So I do think there's a, a, a increased opportunities for us federally and at the state level to work with concert promoters in, in providing information. Yeah, no, and I want to highlight that, because as we're going on the discussions about how to address the problem of synthetics, it's always good to learn from what has worked in the past. And uh, 10 years ago, there was a lot of concern in our country for the increases of ecstasy and the associated negative effects. And there was a very aggressive campaign to educate about the, in an objective way, not, not exaggerating, the adverse consequences. And that very abruptly changed the trajectory. And I think that one, uh, we cannot lose perspective of how important prevention interventions and education of young people about the effects of these drugs. Because many of them don't know, and they take it without lack of knowledge. And that is something that we know how to, in, to actually teach. And we have mounted very, very good campaigns on prevention in the past, and I would urge to do something similar for synthetics. Yep. Senator, when we announced the results of that Charlottesville case that I mentioned, we held an event at which we not only announced the conviction, but had youth substance abuse counselors and medical professionals there to simultaneously talk to parents, talk to young people about how volatile and how dangerous these drugs are. I agree completely with Dr. Volko that we have to augment our enforcement with education and prevention. We have to get the message out aggressively as we do these cases about how dangerous the substances are, reducing demand. Do we know that the drug for sure, I was just reading an article um, uh, that killed those four youngsters, was Molly? We know it was a drug that was sold as Molly. And I'm sure that the people who took that drug believe they were taking an MDMA-like product, an MDMA product because traditionally Molly is MDMA. Um, they have no idea what they're taking. Do they're we just know, relying on the name do Molly. Do we know what was actually in the drug, uh, the we, combination? I don't believe we have. Uh, the toxicology? The to we don't have the reports back. The How long does that, I think the article I was reading is two weeks it, old. The, How? Pro the problem is, is if we do, haven't identified the drug yet, we have to create standards or purchase standards for our forensic labs so they could match the drug. Could, when you do know, could you let us know? Yes. And um, we know that this is going to be a, a pursuit. We're going to continue on and try to see if we can't do 
a multi-dimensional program. Uh, I think, Ms. Volkow, what you mentioned about having some prevention is really important, and uh, maybe there's a way of getting uh, press that are inclined, you know, to talk with people, like Ms. Smith here, what happened to her son, and um, others who are professionals in the field about what is going on, the change of chemicals. I wonder, because so many of these users are very young, how much is unsuspecting and kind of the result of peer group pressure. You know, you can go in this store and you can buy A, B, C, and D. Do it. It's great stuff. And um, it's a mistake. Mm -hmm. In any event, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for what you're doing. It is very much appreciated. And uh, our caucus looks forward to working with you. And we hope we'll have a good bill that comes out of it. So thank, thank you, you very much.